Hey, everybody, welcome to the Top 5 DEI, the premier podcast for and about DEI professionals. I'm your host, Jason Lambert, a.k.a. Dr. J. And my goal is to interview every person in the world who manages, practices, teaches, researches, or publishes anything related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm so glad you tuned in. And if you are ready to learn about some insightful DEI practices from experts from all over the world, and about DEI experiences from people just like you. Join me and let's dive right in. And let's dive right in. Hey everybody, it's Dr. J here. Welcome again to another episode of Top 5 DEI, the premier podcast where we interview professionals who advocate for diversity, equity, inclusion in their work and in their craft. And today, my, my guest today is a very special person who I've had the honor of seeing grow up. She's the niece to one of my neighborhood friends who grew up together, seeing her when she was a kid. And now she is full grown, doing many amazing things. They're very intelligent, very articulate, and just, it's, I'm very proud to be a woman she has grown into. Taylor Coward is a proud Chicago native from the South Side. South Side? Mm -hmm. That's where I'm from. So she is passionate about public service, has worked in government, youth social services, and currently in education, serving as a substitute teacher for Chicago's public and private schools. Taylor holds a BA in English from Governor State University and leverages her passion for books and the English language to foster a love for reading and writing among the students she encounters throughout the city. Recently, Taylor has branched out into the world of podcasting, where she co-hosts a weekly topic-based podcast called When Magic Happens for WBEZ Chicago, Chicago's NPR news station. The show features three Black women from three different generations offering their perspectives on topics ranging from lighthearted subjects like traveling and wine to more serious matters like Black maternal health. The show holds space for women of all ages to voice their opinions and to learn from other generations in the process. Taylor functions as the show's Gen Z perspective and hopes to use her platform to uplift other young voices and show the diversity, intelligence, and power of her generation. Taylor, welcome to the show. So glad to have you. Hi, I am so excited to be here and honored. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Very welcome. It's it's just it's just amazing to to see we we had we hadn't seen each other in a long time, right? We reconnected at uh, a mutual friend of ours' wedding, mm -hmm. and I was just like, oh, well, every time I see you, I always say, oh, you're getting so big, you're growing up, right? <laughs> because no matter how often I see you, I'm always going to see you as as little Taylor, right? A, a baby you know, is a baby, you know, and, and no, no, it's not anything that you. I, I know because I know when I was. Growing up, I got tired of hearing that. Like, I'm adult now. Stop looking at me I'm like I'm grown. a kid. I'm grown. <laughs> I'm full grown. Right. Uh, so, yeah. So, for those who don't know, this show, Top 5 BEI, we ask our guests five questions. And in the interest of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, people have different unique identities and multiple perspectives. At the end, we ask our guests what their top five faves are. And uh, Taylor, at the end, uh, is going to tell us what her top five desserts are and why. So make sure you stay tuned in to the end so you can find out what those are. So let me dive right in with the uh, first question. Uh, and that is, Taylor, tell us how you got into your field. Tell us your journey. Well, so I was entering high school about to enter high school when Trayvon Martin was killed. And it was shocking to see someone that looked like me, someone that looked like my cousins, just gone because he was a Black man, a young Black man. And so that's when I started entering into the world of activism. And I was like, I want to play a part in social justice. I don't want this to continue happening. And so I I entered high school and 
I kind of felt like, okay, well, I can get involved in things in my school. And I was like, that could be, that could be where I start. And then I believe it was 2014, and that's when Mike Brown was killed. So that's when I was in high school proper. And so I was like, okay, now we got to take it to the streets. <laughs> like, it's, I, I need to show up. And so I started to get affiliated with different groups that kind of geared toward youth and teaching them about activism. And I kind of got involved with the Illinois Caucus for Adolescent Health in Chicago. And there, that's when I really started to find my voice, I feel. And they weren't related to the police shootings, but they're more geared toward reproductive health, healthcare access. And I think that's where I got foundational kind of rules of just how to talk to people, how to communicate with people, how to be respectful of all people. And I think that that helped me in the work that I wanted to do in all social justice, especially toward mass incarceration, the police shootings that were happening. But specifically at the Illinois caucus, I had, you know, I learn best when I'm kind of caught off guard by something. So I have a country father. So I say, y'all, I, you know, that, that's just how I talk. And 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 in the I'm also Midwestern, so we go, hey guys, you know, all the time. So I alternate between the two. And I walked into the room and I went, hey guys. And someone pulled me to the side and was like, hey, what if we found something a little more gender neutral? We're not all guys in here. And at first I was like, what? It's like, it's, you know, that's just a, it's a phrase. But then I was like, okay, you're right. And so now y'all is everybody. So I, I really embrace my hey y'all when I walk into a room. And that seems small, but it's a small way to build inclusivity and to make sure everybody is safe and comfortable that you're communicating with. And that's when I learned about pronouns. And even though my, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and just being, you know, making that normal it, it makes it commonplace for everybody and just kind of normalizing everyone saying their pronouns up front. It kind of stops people from assuming, which can be hurtful. And so that was the Illinois caucus. And then my next part of my journey is when I started teaching and I was all over the city. I got to see many different people, many backgrounds. And I just was like, man, like I'm seeing some things I don't like. I'm seeing some things I want to help with. I'm seeing some things I want to fix. And I then moved into a government job. And in my government job, I was the youngest person there by about 10 years. And then the next interval from that was about 30 years. And so a lot of times I find now that I am one of the younger people where I work. And so in the government office, that's when I really was kind of bringing another youth voice to the forefront. Like I felt like I had to do when all this social unrest was happening when I was in high school. You know, people look to youth and they're like, well, what are the youth thinking? But they maybe don't always listen. Mm -hmm. And so in the government sphere, it kind of felt similar, you know. We want to know how to engage youth. We want to know how to get out voters. We want to know what they're thinking, but you don't really want to listen to them. And so my role in my job, I, I kind of acquired youth services. And so I'd think of town halls that youth would need or issues that I saw in schools that I think I could help address on a federal level. And that was really empowering. And it was empowering personally to feel like I was being heard and a very exciting thing happened like I was a person like answered the phone like I answer the phone and I'm gonna do it to the best of my ability you know and we all were also caseworkers and so I was learning about the social security administration I took on veterans affairs and so I just was excited to talk to people so I answered the phone and this lady was going through a hard time with social security 
And she was so happy with what happened. She wrote a letter to the editor of the Chicago Tribune and was like, yo, Taylor Coward, she helped me. Like, I hate calling government offices, but she and her colleague listened to me. They heard me out. And that was just super impactful to me. Wow. And kind of the stage now of my journey is I moved off from government and got back into teaching because teaching allows me the flexibility to also do podcasting. And so in my podcast, I am the Gen Z perspective. And I feel like that is also, you know, bringing young people to the forefront. I, of course, am not the voice of a generation. I am just a piece of it. But I, I think that I'm showing how multifaceted we are as a generation. Because things that I enjoy or feel can be vastly different from someone else within my generation. But at least I can showcase my part. And it's, it's nice to learn from other generations. It's also important to challenge other generations. And I feel like our show being multi-generational, it allows for that. And so that's, that's me at the moment. Sounds good. Well, I I love when I'm hearing about you, you know, and, and what, and a lot of things you said resonate with me too. Like, so when I first moved down to Texas, uh, I wasn't accustomed to saying Mm y'all, but quickly I realized that that's, that's what was the expectation is. And so I was saying y'all a lot. Yeah. And now it's fun. It's like I have opportunity. When I have an opportunity to say y'all, I say it. Yeah. Um, but you're the first person I've, I've spoken with that has made the point that using y'all, that that type of vernacular, is more inclusive. Because you're right, from the Midwest, many different ways how we would, you know, like you guys, and people mm-hmm. still say you guys. But uh, but that's very important. And also pronouns, uh, to let people know that they're in a the safe space, right? Mm-hmm. You say what your pronouns are. So one thing I really love about the show, you said you're the Gen Z perspective, is because it has so many, because it has a different perspectives, three different women, from three different age groups. And, and it's needed to share that because sometimes we live in these siloed worlds of our own, even within the Black community, mm-hmm. based on things like generation, you know, and kind of like what we were talking about earlier, people sometimes view different racial ethnic groups like such as Black or African-American as a monolith, like we're all the right. same. Right. But that show, let's, you know, when you listen to that show, you realize there's so many nuances, so many different differences that, that, that uh, so many beautiful, diverse aspects of uh, Black culture that is still one with those nuances. And it's, I think it's important for people to, to learn and recognize that, you know, to yeah. help them on their own journey to be inclusive with others. I agree. So I want you to, can you share an accomplishment or project or an event related to diversity, equity, inclusion that you helped plan, work on, or currently work on, working on that you're most proud of? Yeah, I, I think right now it would be the podcast. I was fortunate enough to kind of be around during the ideating stage. Like mm-hmm. kind of like like the groundwork, like what's our name going to be? How long is the show going to be? And to to kind of work on something from the ground up has been very enriching. And I just am, I, I am proud that, like you said, it shows that we're not a monolith. But one of my co-hosts is from New Mexico. I'm like, I don't know any Black people from New Mexico. Yeah. I don't think I do either. <laughs> like, Maybe either. Arizona, but, but not New Mexico. But not New Mexico. And so, you know, just hearing what her life was like growing up. And I, the, the Gen X perspective is from the South. And she's like, my parents grew up during Jim Crow. Like, I was one of the only Black people in the school that I went to. Like, I think one school she like, was one of the first to integrate her school. And so just being able to have those conversations broadcasted and you can you can hear firsthand someone in my generation who kind of grew up with diversity 
be like, wow, you know, tell me what it was like to have that experience. I'm I'm really proud that, you know, we're still working out the kinks. We built it and it's it's like a living, breathing thing that we can continue to work on and grow and just have important conversations in. Like we've we've talked about black maternal health, like you said. We got into Roe versus Wade, but we can also not always be centered on sadness and suffering. Like a lot of narratives are pushed about black women. We can talk about food and wine and hair and yeah. everything. So I am very proud of that. Yeah, like the Thanksgiving episode, right? When we are debating pumpkin versus sweet potato pie, you know. I'm 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 a fan. I'm a fan of both, but I think I like sweet potato better. I, I, sweet potato, what? sweet potato. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sweet potato people have it. The people have have have, uh, have, have spoken. Uh, yes, <laughs> man, that's funny. But you know what's weird? I, to, I was I never had pumpkin pie up until I became an adult. Then I not, tried it. Not it even on bad. accident. What? Well, not even on accident. Yeah, but but that's one of those things too that talks about like culture. I didn't. And, and how we we create these stereotypes. I thought that, for example, only white people ate pumpkin pie. Mm-hmm. But listening to the show, I realized, oh, that's not true. I mean, I, I knew, me being a DI researcher, I knew that could not possibly be true. But I still, I think, think I absorbed that as a stereotype mm-hmm. belief that that I had to get rid. Of. I mean, New Mexico, right? Like sometimes, you know, when you're around, you know, black people, you know, like New Mexico. Utah. These are these are states that stereotypically we're not in. You think black people don't live there, but they do, right? But that's yeah. important for people to know, right? You know, right. so we can you know have a more inclusive, universal mindset. And when magic happens, I love that title because magic does happen when you have people from three generations able to come together and share their experience towards one common goal. I mean, that's that's magical. Because oftentimes people from generations don't get one another, right? But yeah. but yeah. most revolutions, most change happens from the new generation that's that's coming up. And mm-hmm. it, it takes us, me, to listen to people from like you, from your generation, to really get it. Because sometimes it doesn't seek in right away, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And and it does, there's gonna be tension. Like there's some things my co-host and I we go back and forth about, but we, as long as there's a mutual respect in the end, you see each other's perspective and you leave learning something. And right. so I, I talked about this at our, our launch event. I was like, I hope that people can come away from this in my generation and feel more comfortable talking to someone 20, 30 years older than them. And it seems yes. scary and you don't want to feel not listened to. And there are moments where I just, you know, I just am like, oh, I just want you to see it my way. But that's that's the learning process is the back and forth and the give and take. And I think if more people have conversations like this, we'll we'll make good progress as a society. Absolutely. Taylor, what's the most challenging and the most rewarding aspect of your job? I, I think that they're actually the same. I think that sharing parts of my life and being vulnerable is both the most challenging and rewarding part of the job. It's challenging because, of course, there's things that, like, you just don't want to talk about publicly. And so I I lost my dad right before the show started. And at first I was like, I'm not going to talk about it because that's going to be. Oh, thank you. I didn't know. Sorry. Sorry. I was like, I'm not going to talk about that because it'll be a bummer, you know, and it's personal and it's fresh. But then in conversations that we had, I was like, I think it's necessary to have this vulnerability right now to level with my co-host or level with the topic that we're talking about. And so I ended up sharing that. And that was definitely a challenge. But then after it happened, I was like, wow, like a listener may have just gone through the same thing or a co-host can relate to what I said. The sound engineer can relate to what I said. And that's rewarding. It's connecting with people and 
and kind of peeling back and not looking at our differences and seeing what similarities we have. So it's it's something I've gotten more comfortable with, but it initially was a big challenge for me was just being vulnerable and sharing all of myself. Wow. This, this next question might be a little similar, but it's so, so we answered this a great segue into this next question of how does your identity inform your work? You know, being a black woman, one, and two, being a young person and being a daughter and all of those things, the, the intersectionality of who I am, it, it, it all comes out in my work. I think specifically, I think the part of me of being a young person has resonated the most as a teacher and as a podcaster in the space that I'm in. I think as a teacher, I'm not too far removed from a lot of the experiences that students are having that I encounter. And I think that it it gives me a level of empathy that may resonate more with students than a teacher that has been out of school for like four to five years. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's true. That's true. I, I had a student who someone told him he shouldn't take the selective enrollment test. That's a, a system in the city of Chicago where you can take a test in eighth grade to go to magnet schools and and i i did that i, I was did? like yeah i think during that time schools were like whitney young morgan park and kenwood or something like that right i, I, right. I remember the, the magnet program yes me and right. my sister, so, sister we're going through the magnet program we had to test okay for it. Too. I remember, too. they still have it that's awesome you too that's great yeah go. hold on cool so i i went to whitney young on the west side of the city and i know, I know yeah I didn't go to kenwood didn't I'm go to town I'm not a Bronco. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a dolphin. And he he heard me. They didn't want to do their work. The students I was with just didn't want to do their work. Mm-hmm. And I was like, look, eighth grade is important. Whether, I, whether you think it is or not, depending on the kind of high school you want to go to in this city, you got you to gotta get some good grades in eighth grade. And... Mm-hmm. Nobody was listening. And then one student came up to me and he was like, well, there's a school that I want to go to, but I found out you have to test to get into it. And someone was telling me that I shouldn't even try. And I was like, why not? Like, Mm -hmm. if you know that it's something you want to do, why not try? And he was like, well, what do I need to do? And this, I mean, I'm 24 right now. It wasn't super long ago that I had to do this myself. And so I told him what I recalled of the selective enrollment process and what I did in eighth grade and my study habits and the study habits I had to get rid of in college and the ones that I kept from being a middle schooler. And I feel like that was helpful for him. And I think that it helped that it was something that wasn't that long ago for me. And I do see a lot of teachers around my age group, which I think is inspiring. I think we could do better about leaning into more seasoned teachers and learning from them and not thinking we know everything, but there has to be a give and take. And so sometimes I get from older teachers, you know, you're not going to last long doing this. And I've been in this game X amount of years. And so I think there's some learning that needs to happen on both sides, but I definitely think a strength in teaching has been my age. And that has really informed how I come at the job. I come at it to help give you the things that I just did and what went wrong and what didn't, you know, what worked and what didn't work and let you go from my experience that I kind of recently had. Thank you. That's a very, very interesting perspective. And it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I, I don't know if you know this, but before I was a, a professor, I did some substitute teaching. I also worked for, I was a manager, supervisor, Chicago Park District, 
Center for Community Arts Partnerships, doing stuff in the community. And it's funny when you're younger, I was in my twenties, you get spirit, you feel discrimination from those who are older than you. That that's a real thing. There's no law that protects you if you're younger, age based discrimination, only if you're like 40 or older. But it's nothing you can do about it. But at the same time, the younger ones are, at least I felt when I was in my role that I was the most effective because like you, I felt like I could speak their language. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you say, you weren't too far, too far removed. So what you say, it, it, it's, it's, it's interesting because now, now as a professor, when I first started teaching like undergrad, you know, fresh out of high school, 19 and 20s. I was probably in my young 30s. I don't know how old I was, maybe. I still felt like I connected. Now that I'm getting older, it doesn't matter if they're out of high school. It's just I'm, I'm old now. I'm just like, you know, my jokes are corny now. Or they, <laughs> it goes over their head. They don't get it. I might say something, yeah, like the Jetsons. The Jetsons, what's that? I mean, they don't know, they don't know what references I'm talking about. I, I just pulled Jetson out of my head. It could be any reference. Yeah. That's just one that pops into my head, but as you get older. But, but it's important to consider that because your audience is important. You know, mm -hmm. if you want them to really absorb the material do well with the information. And it's good that you're working, that it's good to have a system where, and it looks like you're promoting a system where older teachers can work with the younger teachers. So the younger teachers can translate all of that season knowledge and information to the students in a way that they can understand it, relate to it. Mm -hmm. And then older teachers can also learn from you as well. I might have to, after this podcast, get some tips from you how to talk to some of my younger students. I don't know if any of the younger ones are on this Zoom meeting <laughs> with, on this podcast listening in. But, I'll uh, send you some TikToks. <laughs> see, there you go. See, I, that, right? I don't even have TikTok. See, so I don't know. <laughs> no, I need to get on I, I, I know I need to get on TikTok. You got to get on TikTok, yeah. Walk us through an average day in the life for you at work. So... A substitute teaching day, I get to pick my shifts beforehand, which is great, which is very convenient. And I'll go in an app. There's apps for the public school and the private school that I work at. And I just pick up what works for me. And I show up that day. I kind of have no idea where to go. And I just kind of ask around. I have a map of the school and I'm like, hey. I'm working in middle school today. Can you show me how to get there? And every day I'm meeting new people and I'm exploring new parts of the building. And so that's really exciting and it keeps you on your toes. For the podcast, we go into the studio at WBZ at Davy Pier, which is so special to me because I used to just, I used to go to Navy Pier for like special events and I'd go for Winter Wonder Fest. I'd go if I wanted to get on the Ferris wheel. And now I kind of work there. So that's exciting. And we go into their radio station where they have all the equipment set up. And we kind of have talking points in front of us that we've collaborated on the week prior. And we have Google Docs where we go back and forth, talk about what's going to work for this conversation. What are our stakes? Where do we agree? Where do we disagree? And we have that in front of us and we just start talking and we'll typically do two to three episodes in a sitting. I think I, I record this Wednesday and we're going to do three episodes. We're going to do like a marathon so we can stay ahead of schedule. And we record our episodes in advance so that they can be pushed out in a timely manner. You know, life things comes up and we could stay ahead of schedule. But yeah, that's, we record for about two or three hours and we head home. Wow. You're on the next level. Three episodes in one day. I, I'm good if I do one per month. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, man, that, that's, that's awesome. I, I, I need to step up my game then. Again, Gen Z, I'm learning from Gen Z again, inspiring yeah. me. I need mean, to get it together. Just power through some <laughs> DEIs. <laughs> uh, quick question. So I, that's interesting. I didn't know all so much happened behind the scenes. Like, and, and that's good. That I guess you, you say, you look at your talking points, what you agree on and disagree on. I just assume like, hey, here's the topic. This is freestyle. You show up and, and you all talk and. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of that that happens, but I guess it doesn't make sense to organize it a bit. Um, 
yeah, you know, I'm a rambler. So I need, uh, I need some direction. You can tell from the this podcast is going up. No, I, I, I love this podcast. <laughs> it's good to have direction and it's good to, because then you got to know when to stop. So we range between, we've had like 25 minute episodes and then we've had episodes over an hour. And it just kind of depends on the topic. Like Thanksgiving was shorter, but like when Congressman Robin Kelly was on our show talking about like the state of women and girls, that was a little longer. And so, you know, there's people that work there, you know, that like they got other shows to do. And so you got to have a focus. And I think that the pre-production process really helps with that so that you come in, you know what you're doing, you leave when you need to. Because one of my co-hosts doesn't live in Chicago and she comes from out of state to do the show. And so she's got to get back home and do her other duties. And so it definitely helps to kind of make a make a focus beforehand. But that's something I didn't know until I started this. I thought we'd sit down in front of a mic and, you know, freestyle for 30 minutes. And then I learned it wasn't like that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot that goes on. Like, so I don't know how y'all do it. Like for me, I know we're getting off topic. Man, we're going to get to the audience. We're going to get to the top five desserts. Don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. But like for me, so so top five DEI has a structure where it's it's very, very specific, right? I know exactly what type of guests, exactly what type of questions. When magic happens, sometimes you can have a guest. Sometimes you all just hanging out, talking. And you all even do like some like on the scene stuff and interviewing other people with their experiences and stuff like that. So what, what like, do you all have a form? What, how, what makes you all think about, okay, what are the topics that we think are important for our community to know about? And you go into like, when you believe that a certain topic should be aired or interviewed based on a time frame or. Do you fit? And also, this is becoming like a triple barreled question now. Uh, but I apologize. And do you all can think about like like evergreen content, like like, and, and do you make decisions on okay, this part, this this episode is going to be evergreen, like it's something that can, it doesn't matter the time frame, it can be played whenever. Versus right. this episode or what we're going to discuss, we really want this to be very time specific or or related to a current yeah. event that just happened do those conversations happen and how, and how does that work oh yeah they those conversations do happen when the show started i think our topics were more evergreen like you said and i love the word evergreen i think i use the word <laughs> i said they're they're not timeless they're kind of timed <laughs> 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 and but like our first episode was ambition and mm. and we talked to we talked to an elected official in Chicago, and that's something you could play anytime, you know. Right. But I think now we are transitioning into things that are going on now, more timely things. So like Thanksgiving came right before Thanksgiving. Black maternal health was, I believe, during Black Maternal Health Week. And I think that that's a good method of getting in listeners who may just be browsing based on the time of year it is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, they're talking about this thing. I think we do a combination of that. Like we had Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, who runs Therapy for Black Girls and has a podcast of her own. And she came during a time where... I think you could play that episode anytime because it was about like creating community and the power of sisterhood. And so we do have conversations of like, hey, is there something going on right now that we should be talking about? Like Black Music Month is, is an episode that we did. And I think now we're getting a little more, we're becoming a little more relaxed and we're like, let's talk about something that's going on right now. So like Wednesday, we're going to talk about end of the year. You know, what do we have prepared for 2024 and what are we excited about? And so I, I think I gravitate more toward 
those types of episodes because our world moves so fast. Like, I I just want to keep up with what's happening. But in podcasting, it's difficult to do that because something could be really funny or on trend Monday. And then by the time our episode comes out two weeks later, it's dead in the water. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And so (laughs) it is kind of tough to, I think evergreen episodes are a little more forgiving because then you don't always have to be current with the current events of the world. And so I think we kind of are balancing that and trying to do a combination of both the evergreen and the timely episodes. Okay. Yeah, it seems that way too. And you, and you all are doing a great job at that too. It's a great job. Great Thank podcast. you. All listeners, please check out When Magic Happens, the NPR, WBEZ podcast. If you just type in Google NPR When Magic Happens or WBEZ, you can easily find it. And now for the main event, drum roll. Taylor Coward. Yes. What are your top five desserts? And the important part, why? You have to tell us why. <laughs> why? <laughs> the why. Uh, to preface, I have a food Instagram account. Where- oh, wow. Okay, we're about to give, give some like some expert <laughs> dessert recommendations here. It is, <laughs> it is so amateur. It is where I do my <laughs> it's where I do my amateur baking and take pictures of it that leads me to my number one is carrot cake and mm, carrot cake yeah i like carrot cake good for you too i guess <laughs> <laughs> minus the pounds of brown sugar i put in there <laughs> carrot cake is special to me because it's every time i make it is different i posted this on my food account i made us like a story on my account called baking mistakes because oh. I found out that if baking soda isn't evenly distributed in a carrot cake, all your carrots turn green. Really? And I cut into the cake and it looked like a big moldy cake. Oh, man. <laughs> I didn't know that. I'm enjoying tip. Let's just I was know. <laughs> devastated. And so everybody still ate it. But it was like, still good. Yeah. It, it was still yeah, good. Yeah. It, keeps, it keeps the flavor, but that color gets wonky. But mm. I... I learn a lot from carrot cake. So that's my number one. Okay. Number two would be pecan pie. Oh, pecan pie. Yeah, I like pecan pie. I can't, I can only eat so much of it though, because it's so sweet, but it's so good. You so. know, I don't like super sweet pecan pie. And I think it's super sweet when you use light corn syrup. Mm. I, I make mine with dark corn syrup. Oh, okay. That makes it could sense. just be in my head, but I think it makes a difference. <laughs> <laughs> and I also add dark chocolate chips. Yeah. So I feel I feel like that balances it out. And did you make that for Thanksgiving? I I didn't. I I made it. I think I made it last year because you know Archie's birthday kind of falls on Thanksgiving, right? Yeah. And he really likes pecan pie. And so I think I made him one last year. But this year, we had birthday cake because his birthday was like, we celebrated it on Thanksgiving. And so I was like, I don't want to do birthday cake and pecan pie. So I I held (laughs) off. I held off. But I worked at a bakery in High Park. It was called, it's still open. Sorry. I don't know why I said that past tense. It's called Medici on 57th. And oh, yeah. Medici. Like oh, yeah. They have great baked products. Delicious pizza, too. So I love their pizza. Yeah. Um, but the pie that they make is a pecan with chocolate chips. Mm. And they use like a semi-sweet chocolate chip. And so I was like, well, pecan pie is so sweet. I'm going to try a dark chocolate chip. And I just <laughs> really enjoy it. I can imagine. I'll cut this sweetness. They'll make it perfect. Yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. email you a recipe. <laughs> Okay, that's okay. I'm I'm flying up to Chicago for for Christmas, so we can get. Uh, I'll be knocking on the door. No, I'm just kidding. You're like, where's my pie? <laughs> where's my pie? <laughs> where's my pie? Um, now my number three. I think number three would be a chocolate chip cookie. Mm. Classic. classic, classic, right? If it's a good, ch- nothing beats a good chocolate chip cookie, right? Uh, but I add pistachios. 
Oh, pistachios. Yeah. Mm, that's good. Yeah. I like pecans. I, I don't think I've had a pistachio chocolate chip cookie. I'll be good with it. I'll add that to the give, give, give you pastries. I'll oh, add that to the right. <laughs> And what am I on? Am I now on number four? I think you're yes. on four. Yeah. I think four would be key lime pie. Oh, key lime pie is always good. That's a good go-to. It, I found this brand called, I think it's called, it's like Nellie and Joe's Key Lime Juice. And mm-hmm. it's from Florida. And it's because because lime juice is different from key lime juice. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. I've seen key lime juice and lime juice. I just assumed it was some marketing ploy. So it really is a difference. Okay. They're different. Like mm-hmm. lime, lime is pretty close to a lemon. Key lime is almost like floor cleaner. Like, it's it smells like flavor, like flavor, like pledge, like a lemon uh, pledge. It's okay. like very pungent. It's mm-hmm. very, that, and that's what makes key lime pie so tart. But it's one of my favorite desserts because it's only like three ingredients to put it together. It's like sweetened condensed milk, egg yolks, and the juice. I think that's all, and it sets pretty quickly. And I just, I love it. It's like season, all seasons for me. And then number five, uh-huh, is, number five. Is, is Jello. What? <laughs> it's Jello. Okay, you threw me for a little bit that one. I mean, I like I like Jello, but man, I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> That's all because you, you named all these pies and you're making them and everything, and then you say, and then Jello. Because wow. you know, like Jello. Jello, I love vintage recipes. And oh, what flavor of Jello? Yeah, Mike and uh, Asworth flavor. I love a strawberry Jello with fruit cocktail. Oh, it's fruit cocktail in it. Yeah, huh. interesting. I like Jello. I love. I, I, I like Jello. I never liked the fruit cocktail Jello though. Really? For some reason. Yeah. Oh, don't be mad at me. Your whole place <laughs> changed. Like, what? I think you, you gotta like- try it at home. Like. Yeah, home, I forgot. Yeah, home, home, yeah, home, home jello. Yeah, and that's different. It's fun to layer. And I also make Watergate salad with pistachio jello. The what is, I don't know what that is. That's Watergate salad. You know the Jetsons, but you don't know Watergate salad. <laughs> 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 it no. is, it's probably from the same era as the Jetsons. It's like, it's like when everybody Jason was making. Uh-huh. It, yeah, it, it's it's definitely that era of like everybody is putting Jello and stuff. So it's pistachio Jello, miniature marshmallows, maraschino cherries, and I do pecans. Really? Wow! And it, it's a sweet, fluffy, sweet salad called Watergate salad. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm at the, I'm gonna have to check that out. Interesting. It's delicious. Huh. All right, I'm gonna have to try it. No. So speaking of old school salads and Hawaiian salad, I haven't seen that anywhere in a long time. And I is that mandarin oranges? That's it's marshmallows. I don't know how they make it. Like it's, 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 I think it's mandarin oranges in it or any type of fruit with marshmallows. And then I don't know what the base is. It gotta be, it has to be like mayonnaise or sugar in it. I have no idea. All those when I was a kid growing up, there would be Hawaiian salad at a lot of different family and holiday events but the older i get that I, I think maybe some of the older members of the family died off and nobody makes it anymore and it could be I'll, jello it could be jello yeah yeah and i just was a kid and don't remember now i don't think it was i could ever find it in the store so wow yeah. but watergate salad i'm gonna have to look that one up very and- interesting like like how you mentioned the relatives of yours that have gone on and don't make the things anymore. I think that is why I gravitate toward older recipes because I want to keep the things going because they'll just fade away if you don't keep them around. Yeah, you're right. You got to pass that stuff down. That's Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So true. Bring back that Hawaiian salad and keep that Watergate salad going. Yeah, I'm about to Google Hawaiian salad after the call and see if I got the ingredients. Yeah, I'm hoping I'm hoping that's what it's called. I'm pretty sure that's the name of it growing up. 
I think I've heard. we know, you know, in our community, we call it, it could have been many things, call it that. But I'm pretty okay. sure we what you'll find. I don't yeah. know. I'm going to find it. <laughs> well, thank you for those top five desserts. I'm sure uh, our audience is going to look those up and, and, and try and maybe if you have a, well, what you could maybe you said you have a baking page. Is that like a public facing page with all the yeah. desserts or dessert page or yeah, you share that too. Share all the information before we get into Q and A for you. Oh, okay. It's all food, so it's like food I had at a restaurant, food that looked bad. I was at Disney World, and there were I was so excited. It looked so good. It was pecking ducks hanging from a window. Yeah. No, I was at Disney Springs and it was pecking ducks oh. hanging from a window. And I was like, that is so beautiful. So if I see cool food like that, I'll post it. So that's oh. right. Yeah. It's, it's, everybody pronounces it wrong. It's supposed to be Taste of Chicago, T A Y S T E underscore of Chicago. <laughs> I want Taylor Taste. I get yes. it. I like yeah. that. Cool. Thank you. People say tasty. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I mean, you're misplacing the Y or something. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have we have a few guests, not a lot, and so so for our guests, if you have some questions, now's the time you can unmute your microphone and ask Taylor a uh, question. Who wants to go first? Don't make me call on you like a teacher. I was thinking the same thing, you know. <laughs> I know, right? I was like, oh my gosh. Let me amuse before she says, who's the first on my list on the screen? I'm like, popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> right, popcorn. So we put popcorn over to you. Hi, Taylor. My name is Dana Hopkins. I was the outburst of sweet potato, sweet potato. All right. I have a question for you. What motivation, what type of motivational advice or guidance would you give someone that is starting out trying to find their way, you know, not really knowing where they fit in because sometimes you can be by birth younger, but mm -hmm. mentally not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're kind of in the, the middle of both. So if someone is having a bit of a hard time and maybe wanting to give up, kind of like you said, you had a student that was discouraged because someone told them basically don't try. Yeah. What would you tell them to not give up? That's a great question. I would say you're not going to find the answers you want in other people. That's something I tell myself a lot is I badly want someone to just tell me the direction to go in and tell me where to go to get this thing. And I think you just have to find it in yourself, which, sound, which sounds so cliche, but this cook I really like, Ina Garten, she used to work in the Ford administration doing like nuclear energy. And she saw an ad in the paper for a specialty food store and she just bought it and left the White House and became the Barefoot Contessa because that was the name of her store. And people ask her a lot, hey, how do I just follow my gut? How do I find the confidence to do it? And she's like, you have to, you're not going to know where you end up. You need to try things out and you need to see what direction you go in. And you need to look inward and see where that takes you. And I'm trying to follow that. And I'm trying to listen to myself more and not seek the validation of people around me because they're not going to, they don't have a crystal ball. They can't tell you where you're going to end up. And everybody's lived experience is different. And a lot of times I think I'm comparing myself to people that may be Nepo babies and maybe coming from different circumstances and just have had different opportunities either given to them or afforded to them because of social standing, race, class, anything. And so you just can't compare. You can't look at the person next to you. You just got to look inward and, and go to what's guiding you. And I hate to say this, 
follow your heart. <laughs> no, that's a great response. I totally agree. You definitely, long story short, have to block out all the noise. You know, yeah. if you don't believe in you, then then what are you doing? Like, if if everyone who ever invented someone listened to everybody else, we would not have anything. So that was a great response. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was great advice. Appreciate it. Very interesting. Very, very good. Yeah. I'm over here dropping jewels over here. I'm going to tell Archie, like, man, Taylor. Oh, uh, for those who know, though, we keep mentioning Archie's name. People are like, who's Archie? Our Archie is a friend from the old neighborhood. He's basically my older brother. He's like my older brother. When I was a kid, I always wanted an older brother. Didn't have one. I met Archie and he became my older brother. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> Basically, it was like, yeah, he's my brother, you know. And he kept me out of trouble and everything else growing up. And he's my uncle. Yeah, and that name is Taylor's uncle. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who's also my godfather, who forgot once that he was my godfather. <laughs> Give him dual, dual roles. Can't keep up, you know. Yeah, he had, he had both jobs. <laughs> Are we going to popcorn Mindy? Yes, Mindy, do you have a question for us? I'll be a question for Taylor. Yes, I was going to say, how would you, it kind of goes in line with what Dana asked, but any advice for someone that is the only person of color in their, at their current job? Because I had experienced that at my last job. It was kind of like a shock for me. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, really? I was kind of like taken back my first day. So any advice for kind of learning how to deal with really being the only person and really feeling left out of conversations, not really being able to connect on certain things, any insight you could give? Oh, uh, I feel that. that is, yeah, me too. It is definitely a shock. I think keeping a strong network of people outside of work who you can talk to. And I feel like a lot of the time, friends are experiencing the same thing and you could just come home and be like man like can you believe today they were saying this thing because sometimes you hear things that are maybe racist or you hear things that are very out of touch at work and luckily I haven't experienced this in a while but when I first started working I would and I would just say, wow, they really aren't valuing me as a person because they're saying this thing that I would find offensive right in my face. And I just would have to go home and talk to my mom about it. And so that's why I think having people outside of work who you can just kind of vent to that can level with you is super important because you have to let that out. Because how many microaggressions can one person take on the clock? You know what I mean? And wow. Even if it's a friendly environment, it still is not comfortable to feel like an outsider. And this may be strange, but maybe can you bring somebody along that you know? I feel like recruiting could maybe help. Or like if there's a friend that you feel is capable and could do the job, sometimes maybe it could be good to bring somebody along with you that you align with just so you don't feel alone anymore. If you feel your job isn't recruiting in a diverse way, you can maybe do it yourself. Yeah. That, that's, yes, that's... I did. I did try to recruit my friend and they rejected him. So that was tough. I was like, okay, well, there's no hope for me left here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mandy, yeah, I, 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 I understand where you're coming from. And I look at it as different phases of testing the water, testing the, 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 the environment or culture where you are to determine if there's a fit. Because sometimes you might have to just start planning your exit, depending on the circumstances at your mm -hmm. job. And so, you know, start off by, I would say, you know, trying to give it, you've probably gone through these stages already. And at each stage of that back, backfire, it's like a red flag for you to know that maybe you need to move on to, to another um, place of work. But the first part is first, you know, taking that first step and uh, being proactive about trying to connect with 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 them, right? Testing the waters. Like I have colleagues at work, 
I might say something like, yeah, you, you ever watched the show Blackish? You know, something like that. And of course, they never heard of Blackish. <laughs> but now it's on their radar because a show like that, if they watch Blackish, now maybe they have some insight, this exposure, mm-hmm. right? To maybe certain facets of my culture and my identity. So that's kind of a first stepping stone to try to create some, some common ground. So now we have things to talk about at work. So now it's individuals like, yeah, I saw Black the other day. And then we can joke about that. And they're also learning about who I am. And now it's like, is it true that, like, like, like it was an episode where, and I don't want to digress, where it was a little girl, little white girl in the elevator. But okay, Blackish, for those who don't know, know the show. Blackish says, I didn't expect this to be this long. But you know, sh- 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 Blackish is a show about an executive, a black executive, navigating the corporate world. He works at an advertising agency. And the show dives into many of the experiences that blacks, African Americans have working in corporate America you know, microaggressions, being overlooked for promotions, having to behave a certain way and, and speak a certain way, et cetera. So anyways, one episode where there was this white girl who was on an elevator by herself crying. Dre, who's the main character, opens, hits the button, the elevator door opens. The little girl is there crying. Instead of helping her, he looks, he's looking around because he's been conditioned to be fearful to be seen by himself with a, a, a young white child mm-hmm. because of all of the, a lot of us have this in the back of our mind because of the images and because the uh, atrocities that have occurred historically in the United States against Black people, persecuting, lynching, et cetera. And, you know, for example, so, for example, like Emmett Hill, you know, for example, allegedly whistling and a white woman. And then later on, we find out it never even happened. And he was killed in Lynch for that. Yeah. And so in this episode, Dre just let the elevator door close. <laughs> and he didn't attempt to see what was wrong with the, the, the young white girl who looked like a toddler, looked like she was maybe lost or something. And so he asked me, man, do black people really feel like, it? I'm like, yeah, that, that's, mm-hmm. a, that's real. I don't know if I would have, I mean, I probably would have helped the toddler, but it's a TV show. And the whole idea is to dramatize the experiences in the way that black people might feel in those situations. And so this person is now learning just off me sharing a TV show, building mm-hmm. common ground. Uh, also, things that other cultures do, whether it's white culture, Hispanic, Latinx culture, Asian American pan, uh, culture, I, I try and expose myself to things that I don't ordinarily expose myself to to help me have common ground. Uh, and like I said, if it backfires, okay, well, then you've done step one, you've done step two, right? And the next step is to then see if human resources is receptive to any of your concerns. And you can have a conversation to say, hey, you know, that I just feel like, you know, we need to promote some sense of inclusion and belonging. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in uh, what our high, hiring practices look like. And, and, and typically, if the culture is once of the organization wants to change, they might help you. But if, if not, again, it's a red flag mm-hmm. because our mental health and our well-being is very important. And we spend a large majority of our lives at work. And so it's very important for us, if we can, to find a workplace that will be one where we can bring our full selves to work. And where we can also feel that we will not be persecuted or attacked. And so depending on your situation, it's nothing wrong with moving on. You're at that job, get those skills that you need so you can level up to the next position, the next mm-hmm. job, or what have you. Kind of like off the air, me and Taylor, were, we discussed this before about different seasons for different reasons, you know, and so there might be a different season waiting for you for your next journey. So, and unfortunately, sometimes that is the solution just to move on. And, and I hope, hope I answered your question, but I hope that maybe some of that was very, was helpful too. Yes. Thank you so much. Sorry, sorry that happened. And because I'd, I'd be wondering, well, why didn't you hire who I brought? And I'd, I'd be looking for 
reasons, you know, and. Yeah, that might be a red flag, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, well, we are at top of the hour. Thank you, audience members, for those questions. Thank you, Taylor, for being our, our special guest today. Thank uh, you for having me. Oh, you, you, you're very, very welcome. No, th thank you for agreeing to be on the show. You know, I wasn't sure if you were going to say yes. You know, you're a big celebrity and everything now. So, I'm Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've, I've, been, I've been waiting. I was like, all right, man, let her know, man. I want her on the show. So I've, I've been waiting. And, <laughs> and shout out to Archie for, oh, yeah. Start for making this connection. Yes, big bro. Everybody, thanks for uh, joining us today at Top 5 DEI. Uh, and as always, enjoy your day. Peace out. I'm Dr. J.